My family, as you know, is a mixture of the world's two worst races, Irish Catholic and Jewish. In other words, if you can't con them, slug them. I spent a lot of time in Holy Catholic Ireland. My Irish grandmother told me it was the Isle of Scholars and Saints. Well, I've been there dozens of times, and so far I haven't managed to find too much of either one. But the body of Christ is growing in Ireland. People are getting saved, young people are getting saved. I'll be in Ireland next month, in Donegal, Dunanagale, Fortress of the Foreigners in Gaelic. St. Patrick, myth and reality, you know, it's myth and reality. The myth is that he was Irish. In fact, he was from Mercia in England. The myth is that he drove the snakes out of Ireland. The reality is that snakes are not indigenous to Ireland. There are no snakes. <laughs> the snakes were simply metaphors for satanic seduction from the book of Genesis chapter 3 and from 2 Corinthians, as the serpent beguiled the woman. He drove the spiritual seduction out of Ireland because he debunked the superstition of the uh, Druid priests. So in a spiritual sense, he drove the snakes out, but that's not what the early Celtic Christians meant by driving the snakes out. And then, of course, he held up the shamrock, which is just a little thing, it's a three-leaf clover, basically, to explain the Trinity to the Druids and to the Irish. But, of course, everybody did that. It was begun by Tertullian in the third century. He held up a, a branch with three twigs on it. They all, they all did that. The myth is one thing. The reality is another. Things become embellished. Uh, I read St. Patrick's letter to Caroticus, his epistle to Caroticus, and I've read his confessions. He's written two, well, we have rec existing two documents, both written in Latin, but translated into English and, and into Gaelic. And I've read both of them. And of course, much to the chagrin of anybody I've pressed about it, I could find no mention of purgatory, Mary, Pope, Mass, or any other such thing. He just talked about Jesus. The Celtic Church was there before there were Catholics or Protestants. <laughs> that, that's the historical reality. But things changed over the centuries. Things always change. Spiritual seduction, false religion gets in and things change. But this does not begin with the Irish. It began with my other relatives, the Jews. And so tonight I've been told to speak from the Minor Prophets on Eschatology and the Return of Jesus. Turn with me, Will, if you will, please, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 5. Zechariah, Zechariah. His name has to do with, with treasure. Treasure of Yahweh. Zechariah, like all of Israel's prophets, prophesies for three time frames. He prophesies for his own time, he prophesies for the first coming of Jesus, and he prophesies eschatologically for the return of Jesus. In his own time, it was the first return from Babylon, from the Babylonian captivity, which was prophesied by Daniel and by Isaiah and Jeremiah, and it would last 70 years, and they were now coming back. He was a contemporary with Haggai and possibly also with Ezra and Nehemiah. The only difference is this. He wrote in a different literary genre. He wrote apocalyptic. Apocalyptic in Greek, apocalypsis means unveiling. Unveiling. There's no new revelation. What apocalypse means is it's already in back of the curtain. But the closer we get to it happening, the more the curtain lifts up. Hence, in the book of Daniel, seal these things up to the time of the end. The closer we get to the time of the end, the curtain goes up further for the faithful to see what it means. He writes apocalyptic. Haggai and Ezra and Nehemiah are writing about what was happening in history and time and space, a narrative. When they were trying to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and being opposed by Sanballat and the Samaritans and the pagans and so forth. What Zechariah does is shows you what's happening in heaven at the same time these events are transpiring on earth. He connects what's happening in the heavenlies with what's happening on earth. Now this is crucially important. 
We can't understand the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation until we understand Zechariah, what he was doing. He connects events in eternity with events happening on earth. The events we see happening in the world today, particularly in the Middle East, these events are reflections of conflicts taking place in the heavenlies. You see this now. Ahmadinejad, all this with Iran, that's Daniel chapter 10. There's a conflict with the principalities of Persia in the book of Daniel. Well, it's happening. You see things happening in Europe, the reconfederation of the countries of the Roman Empire, etc. All of these things have a meaning, but they are simply reflections in human history and the outfolding of, unfolding of human events of what's happening in the heavenlies. There's spiritual conflicts. Well, the book of Zechariah is one who connects what happens in the heavenlies with what happens on earth. He sees Ezra, he sees uh, Yeshua, not Jesus, but another Yeshua, descendant of the high priest, and Zerubbabel, descendant of the king, before the throne of God being accused by Satan. Like the book of Job, he shows us how Satan operates and how Satan accuses the people of God. To understand the workings of Satan, it's important we understand, certainly, Zechariah, as we have to understand Job to see what Satan does, how he operates. He lifts up the curtain and he shows us this is what the devil is doing. When you see these events happening historically, this is what Satan is doing at the same time. That's Zechariah. But Zechariah continues prophesying for the first coming of Jesus. He uh, speaks of what we call in Hebrew, Hamashiach ben David, Jesus coming in on the white donkey in chapter 5, verse 5, coming into Jerusalem, which Jesus literally fulfilled with his triumphal entry. But when we get to chapters 12, 13, and 14, we see the return of Christ, chapter 12. We see the events surrounding the battle of Armageddon and what follows that in the valley of Jehoshaphat in chapter 13. And we see the establishment of the millennial reign of Christ in chapter 14, 12, 13, and 14. The only way you can make any sense of those chapters is to take the teachings of the millennia quite literally, that there will be a millennial reign of Christ. We see this in Zechariah. But he shows us, first of all, what's going to happen before that. What is going to set the stage for these events taking place in the Middle East and elsewhere? The flying scroll, look with me please, to Zechariah chapter 5. Verse 5, the angel who was with me went out and said to me, lift up your eyes and see what this is going forth in verse 5. And I said, what is it? And he said, this is the ephah going forth. And again he said, this is their appearance in all the land. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Then he said, this is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and cast the lead weight on its opening. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and there were two women who were coming out of the wind. Now the word there for wind is a play on the word for spirit in Hebrew, ruach. And their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork. A stork is an unclean or an unkosher bird, according to the Torah. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where are they taking the ephah? And then he said to me, to build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. Shinar means tooth of a city. It plays on the Hebrew letter Shin, the Hebrew letter Shin. It looks like a crooked W, but it's the word for tooth. The name of the letter of the Hebrew alphabet is also the name of the word for tooth, Shin. Shanain, teeth. But this is Shinar, the tooth of the ear. Shin ear, the tooth of the city. It was a name for ancient Babylon, according to the Hebrew prophet Daniel, chapter 1. We read about this in Daniel 1, chapter 2. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, where Babylon was located. Babylon, of course, dating back to Nimrod and Semiramis, the birthplace of false religion. It has its Old Testament anticlimax in the Babylonian Empire, but it has its ultimate future meaning eschatologically in Babylon the Great, in the book of Revelation chapters 17 and 18 particularly. So he sees this woman in the ephah. Ephah is a curious word. It 
it's a word for basket, actually, but it's also a unit of measurement, a basket full, a basket full. It's not a small basket, it's a big basket. Two women would normally carry it. Even in Bedouin culture today, you can see two women carrying an ephah at harvest time filled with grain. It's big enough for one woman to get into it. Shinar. Shinar. Where they take it. But it's an ephah. It's a basket, but it's a basket full. What is this basket full? What is going into this basket? Why is this woman getting into this basket? And what is her connection with Babylon? What does it have to do with Israel and the Jews? What does it mean for the church? What does it have to do with the last days? All those questions have to be answered. If you like Latin, Novum Testamentum in Vetere Latet, the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. We interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of Jesus. On one hand, my unsaved Jewish Family and friends who don't believe in Jesus will only have a superficial understanding of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, because they don't understand how it's fulfilled in the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. But the converse is also true. So many of my brethren in Christ have a baby food understanding of the New Testament because they do not understand how it fulfills the Old. You will not properly understand the New Testament unless you understand how it fulfills the Old, according to Hebrews chapter 5 and various other passages of Scripture. Well, let's look at this. So you got the woman, bad woman, she's evil, the Babylon motif, and you have an unclean bird. And then other women come, and they are given mobility by the stork, an unclean bird. Bird. How do we understand this? Well, we turn to the New Testament. Turn with me, please, to the book of Matthew, Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 13, first of all, please. We'll begin in verse 31. And he presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in the field... And this is smaller than all the seeds. But when it's fully grown and it's larger than the garden plants, it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now some have ignorantly suggested that this is a parable about faith and the growth of a church. And if we go by faith, although it's a little seed, it'll grow into something big and people will come. That is a conclusion that can only be arrived at by interpreting the text out of context. It has to be interpreted in the context of the parables of the kingdom. Then it continues, and he spoke another parable to them in verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leavened. Well, let's begin with the birds. The birds. In the context of the parable... The birds are not good, because in chapter 13, the same chapter, verse 4, he sowed some seeds, fell along the road, and the birds came and ate them up. You witness to somebody, you give them a tract, you tell them your testimony, and then the Jehovah's Witnesses knock on their door the next day. The devil sent them. The birds eat the seeds. The stork is an unclean bird, goes to Babylon. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. Verse 2, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Now remember, by Zechariah's day, the Babylonian Empire already fell to the Persians. It has a future meaning. And she came and became a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit a prison filled with every unclean and hateful bird. Unkosher birds are figures of demons in the New Testament. They devour the seed that gets planted. Unkosher birds, birds that the Hebrews were forbidden to eat, are pictures of the demonic. To understand this, we have to go back to the Torah. Look with me, please, to Leviticus chapter 11. 
beginning in verse 13, these moreover you shall detest among the birds. They are abhorrent, not to be eaten. Birds you shall hate. Birds that should disgust you, that you should find revolting. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard. Remember where the corpses, the vultures will gather? When Abraham offered the sacrifice, the vultures came and he had to chase them. The kite, the falcon in its kind, every raven in its kind. The ravens, of course, fed Elijah. God will use anything for his purposes. The ostrich, the owl, the seagull, the hawk in its kind. The ostrich is a bird that hides its head from reality. Lots of ostriches in the world today, most of them in Congress. <laughs> and the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl and the white owl and the pelican and the carrion vulture and the stork, which is the biggest of these birds. The heron and its kind and the hoopoe and the bat, which it lists as a flying bird. Actually, it's a flying rodent. Notice these birds are all unclean. The birds that were clean that Hebrews could eat were terrestrial and did not nest in trees. <laughs> Poultry, chicken, capon, turkey, pheasant, they could eat those birds. Unclean birds were these. Birds of prey. Birds that ate carrion, dead, they preyed on the dead, and they were birds that nested in trees. Those birds, the Hebrews, could not eat. They were to be abhorrent. Well, these things are all Old Testament shadows of truths we find in the New Testament. The New Testament tells us that these birds are pictures of demons, according to the book of Revelation. It's a haunt of demons. Every unclean and detestable bird. For the birds! The birds come. Just like the Hitchcock movie, The Birds. Quite a thing. Well, let's look at this synoptically in Luke chapter 13, verse 18. What's the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed which a man took and threw to the garden. Now, a mustard seed is usually used to illustrate in the New Testament something that begins small that can become big, like faith. Here it's a tree. And it became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in it. And again, to watch shall I compare the kingdom. It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leavened. So we've got the unclean bird. We've got the woman, and we've got the ephah. Now we put it together. What is Zechariah telling us about the last days? It's something to do with Babylon, obviously. Something to do with Shinar, with Babylon, Babylon the Great. Woman, demons, represented by an unclean bird, and the leaven. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. False doctrine. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What does Paul say? Your boasting is not good. Clean out the leaven. The leaven of unrighteousness. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Leaven is a figure of the seminal sin of pride. Pride is Satan's first sin. He wanted to be God. Pride was man's first sin. He wanted to deify himself. Pride is the seminal sin that gives rise to other sin. Somebody with a problem with greed, under the greed is pride. Somebody with a problem with lust, under the lust is pride. Somebody with a problem with unrighteous anger, under the unrighteous anger is pride. Pride is the sin that causes other sin. It was the first sin. <coughs> the only one of us with something to be proud of is Jesus, and he had no pride. He was the Paschal Matzah, the Passover wafer that was unleavened. He had no leaven. The leaven, what we call in Hebrew hametz, contributes nothing to the nutritional value of the bread. It simply puffs it up. <laughs> Your boasting is not good, Paul says. But this woman brings in the leaven. She brings in a whole ephah of leaven. And she puts it in all three. It's quite a thing. If you were to break Christendom down, 
into its three large, largest components, geographically and demographically, you'd have the Latin Church, the Roman Catholic Church, you'd have the Byzantian Church, the Eastern Orthodox Churches, and you'd have Protestantism. Well, somebody put leaven in all three of them. <laughs> Somebody put leaven in all three of them. Hebrew was the beginning of it with the Jews who believed in Jesus, so the gospel and Christianity began in Israel as a faith. But when it got to the Greek world, it became a Platonic philosophy. When it got to Rome, it became an empire. When it got to the United States, it became a corporation. When it got on TV, it became a con job. <laughs> the leaven. False doctrine and pride go hand in hand. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the World Council of Churches. Beware of the leaven of Rome. I'm sure I'm offending somebody. 730 million bucks plus law fees, a billion dollars to keep Mahoney out of jail, and he's over in Rome last week voting for the new pope. <laughs> Call it what you want, God calls it leaven. Leaven? A billion bucks to keep that guy out of San Quentin. 300 million to keep the dude from San Diego out of that uh, Soledad. <laughs> Plus law fees. Quite a thing. She gets that leaven in somehow. We the whole basket. Take off the cover. She's in there. But who is this woman who the scripture calls wicked? Well, she's prefigured by other wicked women, most notoriously, according to Jesus, by Jezebel. Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 2. He tells the church of Thyatira, Theatira in Greek, continual sacrifice. Those of you saved out of Catholicism, most of you would know what it is. How many people here are ex-Catholic? Praise the Lord for that. Amen. High money, high mass. Low money, low mass. No money. <laughs> That's what they say in Ireland. That's what I always liked about Monsignor McClarity back in Dublin. As long as you had the cash, he had the absolution. <laughs> Thyatira, continual sacrifice. Peter says he dies once and for all. Six times in Hebrews, he dies once and for all. No, he continues to die sacramentally in the Mass. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, Jesus tells them. Verse 20, Revelation 2, who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so they commit acts of immorality. They eat things sacrificed to idols. What Elijah says in the Old Testament, eating at Jezebel's table. Well, I'm just being honest. This is what they teach. When you look at the Jewish Passover, from where the Lord's Supper, what the Lord's Supper comes from, it was a Paschal Seder, Jesus would have said, Do this in remembrance of me. It was a remembrance. Oh no, it's the same sacrifice. Jesus returns physically under the appearances of bread and wine, which they never even agreed on themselves until the Middle Ages with Thomas Aquinas. But anyway, there it is. Now our Jesus says, if anybody says I've returned physically, other than the way I left, don't believe it. Every time there's a mass, they say he returned physically. The Eucharistic Jesus is not the Jesus of Scripture. Either is the Isa of Islam, where Christ is simply a prophet inferior to Muhammad. Either is the Jesus of Mormonism, who is the spirit brother of Satan, 
or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I got a burning in my bosom, and I testify to you, the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. <laughs> That's supposed to settle everything. <laughs> He dies again, then you eat him? Drink his blood? What the, what the apostles said, don't drink blood in Acts 15. They said it was demonic. Christians are forbidden from drinking. If it's his real blood, why are you drinking it? The apostles said, don't do that. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Count Dracula. Welcome to the mass. <laughs> well, what are you doing that for? It's vampire religion. I'm only telling you the truth. You read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Ridley, Latimer, Hooper. The Oxford Martyrs in England, others, Thomas Cranmer, they were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy, and they came to realize this. They were burned alive rather than worship the Eucharist. We're supposed to sweep it under the rug. Don't worry, a little leaven won't hurt you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. There she is. The woman Jezebel. She seduces my servants. There are many women in the scriptures who prefigure this wicked woman of spiritual seduction, but let's look at another. Turn to Proverbs 5. Verse 3, for the lips of an adulteress drip honey. Smoother than oil is her speech, but in the end she's bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of she all. Oh, she does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable and she doesn't even know it. Her lips drip honey. She has a false anointing. They know how to give religious speeches. Sharp as a two-edged sword? Up against something that's sharp as a two-edged sword, you better have something sharper than a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12. This is the only thing sharper than a two-edged sword. You don't know the scripture. I'm not saying you're going to be deceived. I'm saying if you don't know scriptural doctrine, you are deceived already. She is slick. She's good at what she does. She knows how to talk. <laughs> Just think of a seductress. Think of a high-priced Hollywood hooker. She knows how to talk. Look at Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 4. Say to wisdom, you're my sister. Call understanding, you're my intimate friend that they may keep you from the adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with words. Remember, the true church is the bride of Christ as Israel was the bride of Yahweh. But then this floozy gets into the picture. At the window of my house, I looked through the lattice. I saw among the naive, I discerned among the youths, a man lacking sense. Passing through the street near her corner, he takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night. Remember, Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? In the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom comes for his bride in the night. Matthew 25, the bridegroom comes in the night. Have you picked up a newspaper lately? It's getting dark out there. And behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She's boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She's now in the streets, now in the squares, lurks by every corner. She seizes him, kisses him with a brazen face. She says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today, and I paid my vows. Therefore, I've come out to meet you. Care to attend the novena? To seek your presence earnestly, I found you. I spread out my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt, the figure of the world. I sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. What was myrrh used for when the Magi brought it to Jesus? What is myrrh used for in John chapter 19? Anointing for burial. It's at death 
perfume. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. The myrrh covers up the stench of real death. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. The man is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. <laughs> Jesus is not here. Don't worry. He's not coming back soon. He's taking a bag of money with him. He's coming at the full moon. Oh, the moon won't give us light. It's quite a thing. Quite a thing. She knows how to seduce, just like a professional prostitute. And you think some people become an engineer or a teacher or a dentist or a lawyer or an auto mechanic. She invests herself in seduction. False religion has the same character. They're professional at spiritual seduction. But it's not just Rome. There's worse than Rome. There's far worse than Rome. I live in Great Britain. I pointed this out before. The five biggest Protestant denominations. All of them founded by believers, by the way. The Methodist, the Church of England, United Reformed Church, Church of Scotland, Presbyterian Church. All five are ordaining homosexuals and lesbians. Now, that goes on. Homosexuality is widespread with the Roman Church. They won't tell you that the new pope Frankie the Argentinian, he became Cardinal of Buenos Aires because he replaced somebody in 2002 who was caught molesting little boys. That didn't get in the news too much. Quite a thing. Uh, it goes on in the Roman Church, but at least officially they say homosexuality is wrong. It takes a Protestant to go that low. <laughs> But not just any Protestant. I mean somebody who says they're an evangelical, born-again Protestant. Four weeks ago, in the state of California, I'm only telling you what happened. Interviewed by the Huffington Post, he was caught saying two different things on two different film clips. I'm only quoting him. Rick Warren equivocated on Proposition 8. I'm not against same-sex marriage. <laughs> His partner, Brian McLaren, with whom he co-forwarded the book, The Emergent Church, two months ago, McLaren performed the same-sex marriage for his son and his son's husband. Look what Tony Campola is saying on YouTube. Who put that leaven in the peck? She did. Her lips drip honey. She knows how to talk. She knows how to seduce. Can you imagine Marilyn Monroe throwing herself at you? She's good at it. And many people who don't discern, who don't know, are going to be taken in to the great apostasy of the last days. That's what's happening. Where does it come from? It comes from the birds. Unclean birds. It draws birds. How does she get around? How does she manage this? She gets her mobility from storks. Powerful birds. Storks have huge beaks. Big, muscular wings. Big legs, and they bite the birds. There's so many things in the book of Zechariah about the last days. You've got a reference to the church of Laodicea in chapter 1. Woe to those who are at ease. Woe to those at ease in Zion. Chapter 2, verse 7. Ho, Zion, escape, you who are living with the daughter of Babylon. When evangelical churches are in ecumenical organizations, they are dwelling with the daughter of Babylon. The birds are coming. The storks give her mobility. They carry the ephah. She's in there. 
She's in there. That's what happens. And then the birds nest in the trees. <laughs> the birds nest in the denominations. The birds nest in the movements. It's always the birds. Unclean birds. Birds who God says and told Moses shall be abhorrent to you. Keep away from those terrible, terrible birds. She has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of unclean spirits, a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. These churches who are doing these things are for the birds. She's out there. She's out there with that ephah. And she wants to get in and hide it. Oh, it won't be obvious. It won't be open. It's never obvious at first. She hides in there. But she's demonically mobilized, demonically empowered. Yes, that woman is out there. And she wants to get in. She's gotten into the Roman church. She's gotten into the World Council of Churches. She's gotten into Saddleback. She's gotten into the Emergent Church. She's gotten into the Eastern Orthodox Church. She's gotten into all of these places. My dear brethren in Jesus, in these last days, I humbly appeal to you by the mercies of Christ. Don't let that bimbo come through this.